Welcome to Stoa Conversations. My name is Caleb Ontiveros. I'm here with Michael Tremblay and Chris Fisher. Chris is the Scholar of the College of Stoic Philosophers. He's a manager of the traditional Stoicism website and creator of the podcast Stoicism on Fire. And we are very honored to have him to chat with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me, guys. I'm sure it'll be a, a fun conversation, interesting conversation. So let's start with this broad question. Yeah, what's your story before we hop into it? How would you how would you answer that question? What's your what's your story? We'll skip you know childhood because I could argue that a lot of events from my childhood I think heard me or prepared the soil to be receptive to something like stoicism. But where I was first introduced to anything like what I would consider stoicism was in uh, well, I should say that they, some of the misunderstandings of stoicism was in the United States Marine Corps. I spent six and a half years in the Marine Corps in the uh, presidential helicopter squadron. And, and there, there's a, there's a flavor of stoicism, you know, the kind of the, the stiff upper lip, suck it up buttercup kind of version of stoicism, which isn't real stoicism, but it's a part of the culture. From there, I went into high technology in Silicon Valley, spent 15 years in Silicon Valley as a engineer. And, uh, you know, it was introduced to concepts like artificial intelligence. That was one of my areas of, of uh, expertise for developing a back then what was called an expert system for a program to do something that a human expert was, was already doing. <clears throat> and then, you know, I had a very wonderful career, lucrative career. And in the t- turn of the millennium, cashed it all in and decided to become a cop. You know, I, I, if you're going to ask me for a rational explanation of that, I can't probably provide a fully rational explanation that most people would, would understand. But there was something for me to learn. And now looking back, I know what it was. I became a, a deputy sheriff here in the Tampa area in 2006, was deployed in one, well, the roughest area of, of the county and quickly got introduced to the, the human behaviors that I had not previously been exposed to on the street. And that, that raised a level of curiosity that made me start digging deeper into things like evolutionary psychology, cognitive psychology, and ultimately came across a book of uh, the happiness hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt, which happened to mention stoicism. I read it. I read Irvine's book. I read Becker's book and then wandered across the, wanted to know more, came across the College of Stoic Philosophers and thought, oh, okay, here's an online course. And uh, that was, was it. Completed that course, uh, completed the Marcus Aurelius program, which is a year long program at the college, became a mentor there. And then in 20, it was it late 2015, started the, the traditional stoicism blog. And then in those, and then early 2018 started the podcast. And then in, in 2020, late 2021, when my mentor, Eric Weigart decided to retire, the board approached me and asked me to come back to the college and, and be the, uh, the scholar of, of the college. So that's it in a nutshell. So, I mean, it's such an interesting story because, you know, when, when we see these stoicism movements, we see it in stoicism in the military. We see that discussed. We see Stoicism's prominence and popularity in Silicon Valley and kind of in the tech space, and then Stoicism with first responders. So it's almost like before you before you dove into Stoicism, you walked a lot of these paths that are that really resonate, or people end up attracted to Stoicism within those. But I'm I'm interested in that in that police officer aspect. It seems like what attracted you to Stoicism was almost the behavior of other people, rather than you know how can I do this difficult thing, something like like being in the military or, or professional career, it was actually this, if I was understanding correctly, actually the behavior of other people that drew you to answer, to asking these questions or looking for answers to these questions. I'm wondering if you could dig into that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that's not what attracted me to law enforcement. The, the attraction to law enforcement was to go back into public service yeah, as I had been in the Marine Corps. But then once I was there, I was confronted with this behavior. And you try to find, as a, as a law enforcement officer, you try to find a reason to understand what you are seeing. You know, you're seeing this level of violence. You're seeing this level of, of interaction between humans that you say, this is not conducive to normal society. This is not how people should be getting along. You know, someone disrespects someone, so they stab them or shoot them. You know, the, the, the things that people do just to, to survive, you know, the drug addictions and so forth. So there's a, there was on my part an attempt to try to understand human behavior. What, where is this coming from? And, you know, which led me into a variety of different fields from, you know, reading again, evolutionary psychology, cognitive psychology, Nietzsche, 
just trying to, to get a grasp on all of this. But secondarily to that, once I came to Stoicism, my early exposure with Stoicism was, you know, this idea of Socratic intellectualism, which that, you know, nobody does wrong knowingly. And of course, as a cop, my, you know, my first response, well, that's ridiculous. I deal with people who do no, do wrong knowingly every single day. That's who I arrest, you know, because I didn't fully grasp what, what Socrates was teaching or what the Stoics were teaching from that. And when I came to understand what they were teaching, it put me in a different place because by that time I was a detective and now I had to engage in these you know, in-depth interviews with people who had committed crimes. And that's when I went back and rewrote Meditations 2.1 for me. And I've, you know, I had posted it on my blog years ago, but the idea that when I'm sitting across dealing with someone who's committed a criminal act, I, ha I, I can't see them as a criminal. You know, they've committed a criminal act. They, they've stolen somebody, something, they hit somebody, they hurt someone, they shot someone, they stabbed someone, whatever the case might be. But the recognition that a they they did that because of their own ignorance. It's not because they know good from bad and they chose bad over good. They think the bad is the good, and they're just pursuing what they perceive to be good, which we would argue is not good. But they're not. They're not. You know, people want to say, "Oh, you know, criminals are stupid." I I can't tell you how many times I sat in an interview and I would look across the table and I'd say, "Man, if you if you took your intelligence." and you applied it to something productive, you could be extraordinarily successful, but you're, you're choosing criminal activity instead. But the creativity, the rational thought that goes into committing a lot of these crimes is far beyond what, I mean, admittedly, the average person goes through just going to work day to day in an in, you know, eight to five job. They're very creative. They have to be in order to do what, what they do. But ultimately, I had to come to the place where I could see them as something other than just a criminal, which is, okay, this is a human being that has it shares, as Marcus says in Meditations 2.1, uh, a fragment of the same divine mind that I share in. And that distinguishes them from the pit bull that bit somebody, you know, which I had to deal with as, as a cop or you know, any other animal or, or a truly insane person who has, has no longer in any way a control of their rational faculty. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, great. That's very insightful. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the main reason we wanted to kick off this conversation is because Michael and I had an episode uh, a few weeks back called Six Kinds of Stoicism, and we chatted about mm -hmm. traditional Stoicism, which you have been one of the foremost proponents of, and we thought it'd be excellent to get you on to chat about you know, what you thought about how people sh what people should know about traditional Stoicism and what value they could get from that position and have a discussion about, you know, where people misunderstand each other, where modern Stoics and traditional Stoics might disagree today. So that's the primary purpose. But before we, you know, hop into that, of course, we need to understand what is traditional Stoicism? How would you characterize that view? Yeah. Well, I'll say, first of all, I did listen to that podcast and, and found for the most part, not that much to disagree with. I mean, you guys, I thought articulated traditional Stoicism fairly well as as well as probably anybody standing outside of it can can understand it. And I guess let's go back to the beginning. So if if because the the actual term traditional stoicism as we use it was created in 2015 when I started the blog. And I would argue that prior to the advent of what we now call modern stoicism, there was no need for this label called traditional stoicism because everybody would have just said, well, that's stoicism. With the advent of modern stoicism, Stoicism started to shift in the popular mind, what Stoicism is. So we had, to, in effect, you know, coin a term, use a, just like Irvine did with dichotomy of control, we coined a term that said, okay, well, this distinguishes what was just called Stoicism and what, you know, Michael, when you went to, to college and got your, 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 your PhD, what you studied as a, the, the academic works that tell us what Stoicism is versus what people like Ryan Holiday, Irvine, Becker, you know, go down the list are writing about in the popular culture. And so that was the, the, the coining of the phrase. What is the distinction? Well, it's not a distinction that was created by me. In fact, I can point, point you to three very good sources. If you go to my Facebook podcast or Facebook page, you'll see that I have a, an initial post of what is traditional stoicism. And I'm quoting actually, interestingly, a, a podcast by a guy named Peter Abramson, who does the history of philosophy without any gaps. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Great podcast. 
but he does, I can't remember the exact number, seven to nine episodes on Stoicism. And in one of those, he invites David Sedley. Well, anybody that's been around Stoicism knows who David Sedley is. You know, he's, he is a renowned Stoic philosopher with A.A. A. Long wrote, you know, the, the highly referenced, you know, set Hellenistic philosophy. But anyway, Abramson had, a, I think, a very poignant and, and interesting question that he posed to David Sedley. And he said, we have all these ancients that we look to and we, you know, we call them Stoics, but are we right to call them Stoics? Because was there really this thing called Stoicism? Because these, all, these guys all seem to disagree with each other on so many different things. And Sedley said, that's true. They did disagree on a lot of things. He said, but there were three fundamental things that they agreed on. They all agreed on that distinguished them from the, from the other schools at the time. And this is quoting from him, in physics, to be a Stoic was to believe that the world is a supremely rational, good, and indeed divine organism. In epistemology, all Stoics agreed that there is a kind of infallible grasp, which we can call a cognitive or catalytic impression. And in ethics, that you could not be a Stoic without holding that the only good is virtue. So he outlined it very simply, very succinctly, three doctrines that all the Stoics agreed on. They disagreed on a lot of things. We could turn to John Cooper. John Cooper in a lecture at Princeton University, which is one of the John Locke lectures from 2011, said, in order to understand properly the Stoic way of life and its philosophical basis, we're going to have to learn a great deal about their metaphysical and physical theories, into which, as I've said, their ethical theory is set as the centerpiece of their whole philosophical system. And then you go back to the, the presentation by A.A. A. Long in 2018 at Stoicon, where he laid it out again. These are the three doctrines. He said, Greek and Roman Stoics were in complete agreement about three reciprocal doctrines. One, the rational and providential structure of the universe. Two, the special status, responsibility, and challenges of being a human. And three, our innate potential and goal that we live together in all circumstances. So he phrases them a different way, but he's also the person that argues that when you remove the determinism and the providence from the holistic system, you end up with a system that using his language is, quote, broken backed. So I didn't create this concept. I, I'm not a scholar. I don't have a PhD like you know, Michael does. I don't read Greek. I don't read Latin. I am 100% solely and wholly dependent on credible scholars to tell me what stoicism was. Apart from them, I would be relying on picking up the Stoic text and just kind of interpreting it for myself, which has the same effect of someone picking up the Bible and reading it for themselves. You can come up with all kinds of you know, misinterpretations if you just turn to the texts of the Stoics. So I looked to the scholars. This, the scholar said, this is what Stoicism is. And then the next logical question is, over which I think we have disagreement in the modern world is, is that viable for modern times? And I think that's where you have the divide between modern and traditional Stoics, because modern Stoics, from my understanding and my engagement with them, look at traditional Stoicism and they say, well, that providential order, the idea that there's some kind of teleology in the universe, that's an antiquated idea. You know, in Massimo Piliucci's language, it's untenable in light of modern science. It's not a popular idea in what Charles Taylor would call our, mod our secular age. We've come to a place where the water that we all swim in today is no longer theological water like it was, you know, even when I was a child, no one walked around in public that I grew up with. And I'm, I'm 63 years old, but none of my grade school kids, no one even up until high school would have said, yeah, I'm an atheist. People would have gone, mm, there's something wrong with you. Now you do the same thing. Yeah, I believe in God. And people go, mm, there's something wrong with you. So we've had a complete switch in one lifetime where the, where the social context of what it means to believe in anything other than a mechanistic, reductive, materialist conception of reality is considered odd. And you know, my argument is, and I point this out in a couple of my blog posts, there are a, and in fact, Anthony Long points it out when he says that people who make these assertions, he's concerned about them because when he talks to his biology friends at Berkeley, there's a lot of them that point out to him, there's a lot we don't know even about, you know, about biology and human consciousness. And you just can't make these blanket statements, which end up being their own, their own metaphysics. You know, people want to come on and say, well, show me the facts. I, I believe in science. Well, most people, when they say that, they're not believing in science. They're believing in what I think is appropriately called scientism, which is a metaphysical system that comes out of science. It's not science because what is science? Science is a methodology. 
Science is not a belief system. And in the same way that those who, someone who can say there is no God can't say that from using science. They have to resort to a metaphysical belief system that denies the existence of a God. So the, the primary difference between a traditional Stoic and, a, and most modern Stoic, as, as I have experienced them, is that this willingness to look at what the Stoics said about a divine and providentially ordered cosmos and give it real consideration and think that you ask, is, is it possible to translate this into the modern world? Or do we have to just throw the baby out with the bathwater as Becker did and start with just the ethics? And I argue that, no, we can make sense of this in modern times. And therefore, it's, it's, not, it's not what a lot of moderns want to believe it is, which is some kind of religious fanaticism. You know, I don't, I don't have an altar in my backyard to Zeus. I don't make burnt sacrifices of animals or humans. I don't do any of that. I, I'm, I'm not a, a polytheist, although that was accepted by the ancient Stoics. But none of that in, is entailed by assent to the idea that the universe is, some, is in some way rationally ordered and um, uh, by, 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 by something outside of, I shouldn't say outside of it, by something larger than us. I had one of my podcast interviews was a, actually a Australian, no, he's, he's New Zealand, philosopher, Timothy, he wrote a book called An Anthropocentric Purposivism. The argument is that he's actually, he's a, what we would call you know, more of a, a Bentham in terms of ethics, but his, his base argument as a, as a modern philosopher is that if there is no purpose in the universe, as you know, existentialists want to argue, if there's absolutely no purpose and no meaning, then we have no basis upon which to even start to have a conversation about ethics. You, because it's basically just might makes right. It's a free for all. It's your opinion against mine. If there is absolutely no inherent meaning and purpose to the cosmos. Very interesting book. I would very much encourage you to, to get a hold of it. Lots to dig into there, Chris. So listening to that, I think there'd be two ways to frame this. So one, there's kind of this depth, there's this definitional claim, which is to say, Look, if you're not endorsing these three things, the providential and divine nature of the universe, the capacity for humans to understand the truth of things through cataleptic impressions, uh, uh, and you know, virtue is the only good, if you're not endorsing those three things that Sedley laid out, well, then you're not doing Stoicism. And that's kind of a definitional divide. And I, I think I can get behind that. That makes a lot of sense to me. And then there's this, then there's, I would say, another claim, which is, I do believe those three things as a traditional Stoic. And I think those three things are the, are the right things to believe. And the modern Stoics are making a mistake. It, perhaps the modern Stoics are making a definitional mistake by calling themselves Stoics, but they also might just be making a philosophical mistake by throwing out things, as you said, throwing out the divine too early. So I, I think the definitional divide is pretty clear, but I'd be interested in your argument. You know, understanding that's a big question, but your perspective on, on the best reasons to endorse you know, the divine and providential nature of the universe or our capacity for cataleptic impressions, those parts of Stoicism that the, the modern Stoics, so-called modern Stoics might. Yeah. Well, I just named, yeah, I just gave you one of them. I don't think you can get off the ground, truly get off the ground with ethics without some reference to nature and the way nature is. So, and that's been a scholarly debate uh, since Annis wrote her book, even, even within Stoic circles. But when you read the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, or you read the discourses of Epictetus, and you see real time this relationship that each of them, and even Seneca, the relationship that they talk about between this, what they would call the God within, this divine part within them, and the cosmos outside of them. And how that relationship between their inner source of the divine and the divine that permeates the entire cosmos affects their understanding of human nature and the responsibility toward humans as a whole and toward the cosmos as a whole. I get that people believe that they can get there by other paths, but here's the problem. You know, I, I read broadly, I read, I read Christians, I read atheists and, and try to understand where everybody is coming from. And the, you know, John Gray, who's a very prominent atheist, you know, what I love about his writings is he's, he's truly honest about what atheism is, meaning that he acknowledges that, yeah, this ultimately leads you to nihilism. How could it do otherwise? 
I mean, if you, if you really break this down and you say, okay, there is no rational order, there is no separate intelligence behind any of this, and all of this really truly is whatever word we want to put on it. It's not chaos, but it's chance. It's chance combinations of atoms that over a long period of time just happen to come together in the right way that eventually produces this thing that we are so intimately aware of, which is our human consciousness. When you, if you really believe that at your core, that it's all just chance, then I don't know how you get beyond might makes right. And okay, you can have your opinion, I can have mine, but, and, or even get beyond, well, it's chance that, you know, this race of human beings over here, it's pretty easy to look at them and say, well, you know, they may not be the same at the same level as, as our race because chance didn't work the same way for them. You know, there is no divine peace that I can connect to this, to this other group of people. I can otherize them because they don't have the same thing that I have. When you look at, and, and interestingly, this was, a, I didn't realize until I'd gone back and looked at Tony Long's 2018 Stoicom presentation, he brings up Meditations 423, which is what I quote so repeatedly in my podcast, when Marcus says, everything in your good time, O universe, basically he's, he's acknowledging that he is willing to accept everything that occurs in the cosmos because he's accepting it from a, from a, a rational order. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a fundamental psychological difference, a profound psychological difference, which A. Long, I think, points out very adequately between facing the world as a machine that just happens to operate the way that it does. And no matter what happens out there, it's my, I just got to, I've got to bear and forbear. I've got to suck it up. I've got to just deal with it. Then looking at that same event and saying, and I don't understand how this plays into some bigger picture. I don't understand how this is supposed to be for the good of the whole, but I trust that it is in some way good for the whole and therefore don't have to, I can have a completely different psychological disposition when I'm facing that event. For me, I, you know, without going into detail, when I came across, I, I came to Stoicism as a hardcore atheist. I've made that clear on my, on my podcast. I was, I mean, I had read Dawkins and I had read Dennett and I had read Harris and I was an atheist. In fact, I went through the entire SES program. I was into the second term of the Marcus Aurelius program before I could finally, I, I just, when I would see the word God, I would just replace it with the word nature. And it was in that second term of dealing with physics, I realized I had a hard choice to make. And the hard choice was I either needed to come to grips with this idea or I needed to walk away from Stoicism because Stoic, it was so integrated into Stoicism that it couldn't just be ripped out and leave Stoicism the same. Yeah, I could have gone back and you know, read Becker and been okay with that, you know, Becker's ethical approach, but there was something fundamentally different here. And once I did what, I think it's, I think, forgive me if I'm wrong, maybe Kierkegaard who argued about to, you know, to step into the open space. When you step into that and just try it on for a little bit and you say, okay, well, what would the world look like? What would my life look like? If everything really had a purpose, if everything had meaning, what would that be like? Just try it on for a little while. And when I did that and I look back at what the things, the events that occurred in my childhood and the the sequence of events from going, you know, being a U.S. Marine to going into high tech to becoming a cop on the street. And I look, all of this, all of a sudden instantly kind of fit into this neat little pattern. And I went, okay, th this appears to be in some way ordered. There was a reason why these things happened. And it wasn't just random events that occurred. And, and when, I can, when I look at it that way, those events that occurred in my childhood that I could say, well, I was a victim of that. I, you know, those were hurtful, harmful events. I could look at that entirely differently. And I can say those events formed my character in such a way that prepared me for the future. And, and here I am. So it is a different way of looking at it. And one of the ways that that's very applicable in modern times is what do we do in modern times? I mean, you're nobody today in the 21st century, unless you're a victim of somebody or something. You're just nobody. I mean, you don't count unless you're a victim. We, we teach victimhood. And the Stoics would have said, you're not a victim of anybody but yourself. And, but that view comes from a distinct view of the way that the world is, the way the cosmos is. And the idea that, um, I mean, let's face it, we can't prove that, the, no one can prove that the, the world is providentially ordered. It's far beyond, it would never, it's a metaphysical argument that can't be proven or disproven by science. In the same way that 
you know, Lawrence Krauss can argue all he wants that it happened from nothing. That's a metaphysical argument, a universe from nothing. It's not a, it's not a scientific argument because there's no method, scientific methodology that we can apply to demonstrate either one of these. So what are we forced as humans to do? We're forced to follow two paths. And I followed both of them. You follow atheism as far as it goes and the arguments that support it. And then you follow theism as far as it goes, some form of it. And you say, okay, they both lead me to the same place. I have to make an existential choice. Am I going to live my life this way or am I going to live my life this way? And I think that's ultimately what this, what the Stoics argued is that it has a profound, the ancient Stoics, this way of viewing the cosmos, which is why they argued it so strongly against the Epicureans, has a profound impact on the way we behave, the way we understand things, and our lives. That's a, it's, a, it's a big piece to bite off for moderns, because again, we live in a secular age where they've been taught that these things are nonsensical. They're old ideas, but they haven't, but they haven't been taught what the, real, the Stoics really said about God and providence and logos. They get their understanding of those from Sunday school, from you know, listening to a fundamentalist preacher on TV. And that's not what the Stoics were about. It's something entirely different in the same way that they, they used a lot of words different, that it's the struggle for the modern to get over their own prejudices. I mean, the word happiness, virtue, how many people are turned off by virtue? You know, I've, I have argued, and I think rightfully so, I would, I would love to, you know, to have the challenge say, okay, hey, let's, let's, let's run a little test. I want you to stand on, I don't know, what's the busiest intersection in New York City? Times Square and what? Whatever, whatever it is. We pick the busiest intersection for foot traffic in New York City. You stand on that corner. We're going to have somebody else stand on the opposite corner. And we're going to give them, everybody, the choice. You, get, you have one of two propositions. You can, either, you can either assent to the idea that virtue is the only good and that you don't need anything else in your life to, ha- to experience well-being and to be happy. You don't need any money. You don't need a, a, any good health. In fact, you could be being tortured on a rack and still experience happiness. You could be imprisoned in jail and still experience happiness. You could be living in a war zone and still experience happiness. Or you can believe that this cosmos that we live in is somehow cosmically, providentially ordered by some kind of an intelligence that we don't really fully understand. And I would argue, good luck convincing moderns really what, what the Stoics meant by the word virtue. You see, we kind of peddle that word, but how many, even modern Stoics, how many modern Stoics really, truly say, oh yeah, none of this stuff really, really matters? I think it would be useful to zoom into what the Stoics meant by these ideas of God and providence. Since, as you say, I think a lot of people, when they think of these teleological images of the universe, the first thing that comes to mind, especially in the West, is an image of an all-powerful, all-knowing all good gods sort of ordering things in a particular way. But the Stoic picture is, is different. It has to do with nature, mm-hmm. of course. But you know, how, how do you describe that picture and how does it differ from or differ from what you might call the more machine-like view of the universe where there's a sense in which things are ordered, right? They follow some mm-hmm. natural laws of cause and effect. Mm-hmm. But I don't think you, we would say that view includes a Stoic providence unless, except in a, perhaps a metaphorical way if you wanted to save a stoicism for a more naturalistic picture. But how, how would you describe, how would you do? Yeah. I mean, obviously we see order. We know that the world is orderly. So the argument from the opposite side is, well, it's orderly because it's organized itself into this kind of machine that is now orderly. But anyway, so I think sometimes, you know, there, there's a, in the Eastern world, there are some religions that say you can't put a word on God. You can't define God. And once you do, you misunderstand it. And I think that's to a large degree true of Stoicism too. You know, we, in modern times, we label them as pantheists. A. a. Long labels them as panentheists. But those terms are invented a long time afterward. And they, they kind of fit, but they kind of don't. So I've always said that the easiest way to understand the Stoic God is to understand to first what it is not. Okay, It's not a bearded guy sitting up on the clouds, throwing thunderbolts down at people that he doesn't like. It's not a God that intervenes on your behalf because you said the right magic words, you said the right prayer, or that you've, you've lived a life that is good enough for God to intervene for you, dispense with the laws of physics temporarily so that you are somehow treated differently than everyone else in the world. Okay, That's not the God of Stoicism. The God of Stoicism is not one that, that wrote a rule book. Here are the, here's the, you know, 
the, the book of rules that you have to abide by. The God of Stoicism is not someone that's going to condemn you to heaven or to hell. So what is it? It's a, it's a, a rationality, a literally a mind. And I use that word, that mind, because it's, it's interesting how many modern physicists, physicists, astrophysicists, and quantum physicists use that word to describe what they see in nature. That this almost there's a, a people use they'll use words like there's a mind like background to the cosmos. This appears to be operating like a mind. I forget who said when we see all of these astronomical um, this fine tuning, it almost looks like the universe was waiting for our arrival. So we see this what appears to us to be intelligence, and we have the ability to to determine that. So what does that mean in your day to day life? Well, it's the difference again between. This is an accidental event, and it, it's an event that occurred and may not be in your best interest. And that's the whole point of, it's Tim Mulgan, an anthropocentric proposivism is the idea, his idea goes a little farther than the Stoics because he says the universe has a purpose and the universe, the purpose of the universe isn't ours, doesn't, isn't necessarily ours. It means it has a purpose of its own. We are here. Now, the Stoics go a little farther than that, and they say that, yeah, the purpose is maybe not the ultimate purpose, but that we are a part of the divine purpose, the divine intention, this, this teleology. Mm -hmm. But his argument is that, yeah, it may be, and he contrasts that with atheism and but on one end and what he calls benevolent theism on the other end. So benevolent theism is the concept that most people have in modern times right. when they think of God. If I pray to God, if my, if my daughter or son dies, God, why did you take my child away from me? And then the flip side of that is, well, your child wasn't taken away from you. God wanted them in heaven. And we have all of these things that where God is, is interacting in a way that is interventionist in our lives, as opposed to, and this is where the, you know, the Stoic conception of, a, of teleology can get rather naturalistic in the sense that the laws are created, the world is created in a way to play these things out the way they do with divine intention, but it's not going to change because you don't like it. Now, the, it's just going to be the, the way that it is. But here's the distinction. And here's why I don't sometimes like the, the, the label pantheist, because there are people, in fact, I had one come onto my Facebook group one time and argue that he was a pantheist and an atheist. Okay, well, it's a, an abuse of language. You know, the etymology, I'd like to see the etymology of that. But the point is, is that there are a group, they call themselves scientific pantheists. It's what Richard Dawkins calls sexed up atheism. So what is sex step atheism? It's looking at nature and saying, man, isn't this marvelous? Isn't this wonderful? This is, this is divine. Let's call it God. Okay. That's, that's distinct from this is God. Therefore, it's divine and wonderful. So it's a bottom-up approach a way of looking at it versus a top-down. And the Stoics looked at it as top-down, why, why, which is why they can argue that our rationality isn't a chance combination of atoms. It has a source, and that source is divine, and that is God. And it is, yes, it is nature, but it's not just trees and animals and, and you know, rocks. It is the intelligence that is uh, that is that permeates all of those entities that makes them what they are from the rock that has a level of tonos that just holds it together to the animal which has a level of tonos that and a suke that actually or a plant that allows it to seek out it's in the soil to the animal which is the next level up that has a soul and can wander around and find its food to the humans who are distinct from the animals in the sense that we have this other piece that makes us, that we share with God, which makes us truly rational and therefore able to assent or not assent to the impressions that we, our rational faculty presents us with. Mm -hmm. So the moderns, I mean, the irony is, is that if, I think if moderns took the time to understand the Stoic conception of God, they re realize they don't have something to fear by it. It's not some boogeyman in the sky. The hurdle they have to overcome is, uh, and maybe this is where Irvine comes in because Irvine says basically in his argues in his book, if you're going to be a Stoic, be a closet Stoic. Okay. Well, you're, you're, maybe you need to be a closet traditional Stoic. You don't need to walk around the streets and tell everybody, yeah, I believe in a divine and providentially ordered cosmos. 
But ironically, how many times do you hear from people who will simultaneously they claim that there may be an atheist or agnostics who say, well, everything happens for a reason. Really? <laughs> what reason is that? You know, if you're going to use the word reason, what reason did these things happen? What, what reason was there for my child dying? You said everything happens for a reason. Well, what's the reason? If I live in a, in a, truly in a mechanistic universe that has no fundamental, at its basis, no meaning, no teleology, then what could possibly be the reason? It's just another chance event that occurred because my daughter got this particular disease or my daughter happened to be in that car at the time that it entered the intersection that's with the drunk driver and this, these things happened. Right. So it seems like the Stoic model of God, you could call it benevolent panentheism, if you want it to be precise, right? It's probably closer to panentheism than pantheism. And it shares mm -hmm. with benevolent theism this idea that the all these events that happen in the world are for some greater purpose, whether that is the design of God in the theistic picture where God's some independent entity, of course, or this rational providence. And it's this benevolence that gives you this added frame on the world that oh, there's something here. It, maybe you don't want to call it mm -hmm. benevolence, but you could call it reason. There's a reason that you can grasp for why things do occur. And that speech, there's a reason for everything that happens. It's not merely metaphorical in a way it might be for mm -hmm. an atheist or a more someone who's more liberally religious, but it ma maps on to the way the world actually is. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the reason. And yeah, I, I personally, I think probably the best term, which is not a common term, is called pandeism. I wrote a chapter in a book on pandeism, Gene Pandeists, to look at Stoicism, because the definition of pandeism is that God became the cosmos. You know, it's God one day, it's cosmos the next, chooses to, 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 to turn into the cosmos. There is language, and I think that's where Long comes to that. There's language that would imply, you know, the cosmos is inside a void. And so therefore there's got to be something outside that. And that kind of gets you to this panentheism. There's still some God remaining outside of the cosmos. However, the God that remains outside the cosmos still isn't an interventionist God. And that's where, you know, when you see Epictetus, Epictetus is very, probably the most, we say the strongest advocate for what we might call benevolent theism. I mean, he calls God father. He says, basically, mm -hmm. God is involved in everything that he does. But the flip side of that is you don't see Epictetus praying for things to be different. You don't see Epictetus making any kind of claims that, you know, he can somehow make a sacrifice and everything's going to change. Any sacrifice that he talks about, and he does talk about on occasion, is what? A sacrifice of thanks. Thank the God that I broke that habit. But go make a sacrifice. He says, if you haven't done this in 30 days, if you broke this bad habit, go make a sacrifice. You didn't go to the altar and ask God to take the habit away. You went to the altar and thanked God that you were able to overcome this, this you had the power to overcome this, this bad habit. That's a fundamental distinction when we get to things like benevolent theism. So I wanted to, I mean, Chris, the, the really, really interesting stuff, enjoying this and, and thinking about it in, in my own journey, in my own relationship with Stoicism. If, if we're defining modern Stoicism as kind of the rejection of this theological picture as being false or unnecessary, I wouldn't say I'm a modern Stoic, but I would certainly say that my emphasis has, has neglected this part of it or the, the theological divine aspect of Stoicism. I think because as you say, it can be different, difficult to put on that cape or it's not kind of the way, you know, it's not the paradigm that I'm raised in. It's one that feels uncomfortable or unfamiliar and one that I kind of have difficulty looking at problems through unless unless it seems necessary. It's like, well, if I, if I can avoid it, I'm going to avoid it because it seems it seems uncomfortable and difficult. And that's something I'm, I've been reflecting on while you were while you were speaking to that. But one point I wanted to take it, and I might be missing the point a bit, but I want to think about the experiential benefits of incorporating this divine aspect of the universe into your Stoic practice or into the way you look at Stoicism. So there, there, there's one view, which is, you know, if you're modern Stoic, you, you're missing something. You're not doing Stoicism. You're not getting something. You're not understanding something that's important. But then there's another view that would be, if you don't incorporate this part of it, this part into your practice or your understanding of stoicism, it will affect the way you live your life negatively. You will, you will, you know, you will be more difficult to achieve virtue, be more difficult to have equanimity in difficult situations. So wondering in your experience, people that, that go this traditional stoicism route or incorporate the divine, what the experiential benefits are to 
emphasizing that in your stoic practice? Yeah, again, it, it's it's viewing, it's the ability to a view, to view the events that most people would look at in their life as tragic, as unwelcome, that they are victim of or whatever, and being able to see them truly as a preferred indifferent, a dispreferred indifferent. Why? Because in some way that we're not going to understand because we only have a fragment of the divine. We don't have the whole piece. In some way, this fits into something bigger and has a purpose. So if you look at back at history, we can point to a number of what we could say horrific and tragic events that we could say occurred in history. But you also look at, at those times, those events produced a a, a new understanding on the part of humans that changed the world profoundly. We could look at World War II and what Hitler did. And we could say, you know, how many, well, I think, I, I don't know, gross estimate, 60 to 80 million people died as a result of World War II worldwide. But look at where we came as a human race as a result of World War II. You know, our, a new understanding of, of racism, a new understanding of how the ideas of Darwin could be used in a wrong way if we're not careful to argue that we need to get rid of these weaker weaker human beings. It turned into the creation of the Jewish state. I'm sure there's a lot of Jewish people that are very thankful that they have that today because of those events. We probably, it'd be hard to argue that you have a Jewish state today if you didn't have World War II. We can look back at things like slavery, how as horrific as it was. In the end, it brought us a whole new awareness. Slavery had existed forever in human society. And it really culminates in many ways here in America in the Civil War where you've got brother against brother saying, no, this is, this is wrong. This is something that we need to address as, as human beings. So, And now, in theory, we are supposed to be able to look at one another and not see color. That's the whole idea, is that we shouldn't see this other race and think that they are inferior to us or superior to us in a, in a human sense. So all of this is a, just a different way of of looking at the events that occurred in nature. Now we get to your own personal life. You get to look at, again, something horrible happened to me as a child, as an adult. What possible meaning could there be in that event? If it, if it did have meaning, if this is supposed to take me to a different place, if I'm something I'm supposed to learn from this. I used to come home, when I right before I found Stoicism, I would come home to my wife and um, you know I had been a guy that, that drove a Mercedes to work and wore custom suits and ties in Silicon Valley. And now I'm coming home in a sweaty, nasty uniform and, and telling her some of the stuff that's going on. And, and when I was going through the, the real, I would call the psychological abyss part before I found stoicism, she would say to me, why don't, why don't you just quit? Why don't, why, you know, because I still had headhunters calling me, wanting to take me back into the high tech world. And I always had the same answer to her over several years. I said, no, there's something for me to learn here. I don't know what it is yet, but there's something here that I need to learn. And I stuck with it long enough to learn that. That's the distinction. Again, I'm not a victim of outside events. These outside events are just indifference. And in fact, if I view them the right way, they're not just indifference. They're now grist for the mill that allows me to develop my own moral character, my own um, um, proresis, my own rational faculty, and eventually you know, if you're lucky enough to develop virtue and become a sage, which a whole different topic that I don't hold on to, but, you know, so there's a, there's a fundamental distinction. And, you know, interestingly, now we're not talking about stoicism. I would love to see this study done, but I don't know that stoicism, stoics are a large enough body to do it. But in, in study after study, what do the psychological studies tell us about the difference between people who believe in God and don't believe in God, who have some form of religion in their life and don't? The people who do, are generally happier. They're generally more well-grounded. They're happier with their lives. That's, that's just a fact. Those are the studies done not by Christians, not by believers, but by academics who are attempting to, to, to draw out the truth. So we see that in, at its basis. I've got a very good article, and I can't remember who was written by, specifically addressing stoicism and cognitive behavioral therapy. And but it, it comes out of, I think it's Jürgen Habermas, maybe, who talks about the, the two models. We have a model of the world and a model for the world. And our model of the world is our physics. Our model for the world is our ethics. But basically, the argument is that we all carry around 
a model of the world, the way the world is. We don't, we don't think about it. We don't talk about it on a regular basis, but inherently we have this model. One of those, one part of that model is that the universe kind of is, is orderly. You know, when I get in my car and I get onto the freeway at 70 miles an hour, I'm trusting that the laws of physics are orderly enough that it's going to behave the same way today as it did yesterday. And my car is going to stay in its lane going down the freeway at 70 miles an hour. So we have this tremendous trust in the way that the world works and we have a model from which we operate. Where's that model come from? It comes largely from the society that we're raised in, it comes from our family, it comes from the educational institutions. You, know, you talk about the idea that you're uncomfortable with it. Yeah, it's, it's socially uncomfortable to go out into the public and say, yeah, I believe in some kind of divine order in, in the cosmos. But I would argue and counter, how socially comfortable is it for you to go out and argue that virtue is the only thing you need to, to have well-being and that you, know, you can be happy being in jail? You could say, yeah, you know, those prisoners that, are, that have been locked away for the rest of their life, they have they're just as much ability to be happy as I do. The average person would look at you and think, you're insane to, say, to make an argument like that. So we kind of avoid this social uncomfortableness about this idea of virtue because we kind of gloss over it and we say, oh, well, yeah, we're, we're looking for virtue. And it literally can, can turn into kind of this virtue signaling. You know, this, we've got this magic word that we're, we're aiming toward, but when we really dig down on it, that is, I would argue, in fact, more socially unacceptable if you announced the true meaning of both, that is more socially unacceptable. And if you want to use the word getting canceled, getting shunned, getting driven out of the academic community, whatever the case might be, you make an argument for either one of those, you're probably going to be on a, suffer more incoming fire from the idea that you don't need any externals in order to live a happy or ironic life. Right. Yeah. And ultimately, as a stoic, you shouldn't mind how much fire you get for whatever view you think is correct, as long as you think you have good reasons to, to put forth. I'm curious yeah. how you frame this. So, you know, there's a classic problem of evil with views about that hold that there's some amount of benevolence in the world. And mm -hmm. there's a distinction between, you know, if, if good things or if, if bad things happen, why does this all good purpose let it happen? All good purpose, all good God, whatever it is. And there's a distinction between there being a justifying reason for the person for whom the evil occurs, or there being some a justifying reason that just re that refers to something larger. So the idea would be during an amputation, there's a reason that justifies the existence of that bad, you, you, you could call it, of the amputation that refers to the whole organism. As opposed mm -hmm. to me saying there's something bad that happened in my personal life and there's a reason that makes sense for me that I can make sense of in my own life, which a lot of theists might say. So to what extent do you think the Stoic can say not only is there a reason that justifies the existence of these apparent bads or this preferred indifference, whatever they are, that refers to nature as a whole as opposed to some reason that is relevant to my own life? Or am I just like the leg that's getting amputated for the sake of nature as well? Well, I guess you could you could look at those as both. You could be the leg that's getting amputated, which is kind of an argument that the Stoics make, right? The whole idea is that it, when we look at good and evil in Stoicism, I mean, Cleanthes famously says that the only evil that exists is the evil that men do in his in his hymn to Zeus. And there's an interesting there's an interesting passage in that that I think for me is profound, and I think sometimes gets overlooked. And Cleanthes says but you make the crooked way straight. So I interpret that to mean that in spite of all of the evil that we're able to do to ourselves and to others, somehow there's this with, within the, the way that the, the cosmos exists, the way that it was created, the way that it operates, there is kind of a, a homeostasis. There is a, there is a balance that, that necessarily always maintains itself so that Hitler can really never become the dictator of the whole world. People like Hitler can come up, but there's balance against it and it gets corrected. It gets fixed. You can go off track in your life, but hopefully it comes back. So the, I've looked at that from Cleanthes as, yeah, there's kind of this directedness, again, this teleology that things are going to go in that direction and you're not going to be able to veer too far off the path. As far as you know, we say, well, why do these things happen? Am I the, am I the leg that's getting ap amputated? Why, why do these things happen? What is the purpose? Well, ask if they never happened. I mean, try, try to play the mental game for just a minute where we live in a, wor a world where everything is preferred indifference. 
everything is good. Everybody is virtuous by nature. God just designed it that way. And we never have any struggles and we live forever. And the question would become, where would you, how would you develop as a being, how would you develop any moral character without those indifference, some preferred, some dispreferred? So these indifference are literally, these bad things that happen are literally the grist for the moral mill. They are our opportunity. So why did that happen? Well, I lost my leg in that car crash because, you know, it's not God today decided you're going to lose your leg. That's not the whole point of it. The point is I can say that this is the way the world played out and I lost my leg. And now I have the opportunity to learn something new about this that I didn't have. Now I'm, well, I lost both my legs. Now I'm in a wheelchair. I'm always, I don't know, both fascinated and inspired by people who, you know, end up as quadriplegics, paraplegics and overcome that and find a way to, to still develop, it, look at what happened to them in a different light. And, you know, they could be Lieutenant Dan in Forrest Gump and be angry about it. You know, eventually he comes around, but, you know, he goes through a whole process of cursing God and being angry about it as opposed to you see the people, and I forget the guy from the, the Olympics that, that you, know, you lose your legs and you, you choose a different life and you choose to say, this is, had, this is taking me in a different direction than I was going before. It's an opportunity for me to develop my rational faculty, my character, to use Chrysippus's language, a way for me to develop my cylinder in a different way that I would not have had. So over the course of my life, long before Stoicism, you know, there were very few people that, that knew about my, that I talked with about my early childhood. And the few people that I would talk to, they would always, I would always have kind of the same response. Well, how did you make it through that and be, you know, essentially a normal human being, you know, and for those that actually do consider me essentially a normal human being. But the, uh, the point was, I always said, you know, here's how I look at it. Okay. I look at those events and I say, that happened to me, but I was raised in that environment. So how different is that, those events for me in that environment than the 18 year old girl who's been, who's beautiful and has been, you know, raised in, you know, somewhat wealth and, and, and her beauty is everything. And she's the pageant queen and it's the night before prom and she wakes up in the morning and she's got a big zit on her nose. You know, that's a pretty tragic event for her in the world that she lives in. Now we would look at that and we comically say, it's, it's a zit on your nose. It's not that big of a deal. But to her, because she places her values on her beauty and this is a big event for her, this is tragedy. You know, you're, this is your prom. It's a one-time thing and you've got a zit on your nose. We look at, we don't need to look any further in America at Hollywood. We think, oh, if only I could have wealth and I could have prosperity, everything would be okay. Really, look at the children of Hollywood stars. How many of them are normal? Not too many. Right. Look right. at the you children of politicians. You might not wish it on your best enemies. Yeah, look at the politicians. Look at the children of people who have money and power. And those are the things that we say are good and we aspire to, but we see they, they destroy lives because why? They're again, they're achieving, they're looking for their well-being in things that everybody thinks are good, but the Stoics would say, no, those aren't, those aren't good. Those aren't goods at all. You know, in, in fact, one of the decisions, you know, when I said I made the decision to throw it all in and go back into public service as a cop. I was living in a 4,500 square foot custom home in a gated guarded community in the foothills of California, driving a Mercedes to work every day. I would come through the gate, the, the gates of the community. And this is, this is a guy that grew up, I mean, in Appalachian style poverty, the kind of poverty we really don't see in America today in my early childhood. That's what I grew up in. And I would drive down the streets and I would look at the houses and I would think, this is not me. This is not who I am. Yeah, this is what I've achieved, but this is not who I am at my core. And at Christmas time, we would have just this ridiculous display of presents for our, for our children. You know, my oldest boy, oh, you need a, you need a motorcycle? Yeah, we'll buy you a little mini, you know, we'll buy you a, a, a Kawasaki KX90 or whatever it was back then. You know, no questions asked because the money was there. And I remember one day my, my wife and I, my wife grew up not in the same kind of poverty, but she grew up in you know, lower middle class in Seattle. And I said, how do we raise kids with any character at all in this? I mean, how, how do we do this? And our youngest had just been born and we were both like, I don't know. 
So I turned their whole world upside down and swore in the poverty and became a cop. So, but, but seriously, my kids were able to develop a lot of character traits as their experience of having a dad as a cop and living in a you know, crappy little house here in Florida than they would a completely different perspective. And I think they're better quality human beings than they would be if I would have raised them in that community in California with all of that, that wealth and money. Now, does that make wealth and money bad? No. It's, it's just a preferred and different that can go horribly wrong if you don't know how to handle it properly. It's not that those things are inherently bad. They're just indifference. Yeah. Great. Well, this is one of the reasons, I mean, I'm, I'm for those listening, they know that I, I'm a martial artist and I've done a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu and a lot of, I've been part of the fighting community my entire life. And one of the reasons I advocate for that is, is this, this capacity to add difficulty to your life. Even if, even if you're in a relatively strong position, ha- has a lot of benefits, selfish benefits or personal benefits. So that, that, that story definitely resonates with me. One thing I, I wanted to ask, so we've been focusing a lot on the theology and the divine aspect of Stoicism, but and we've, we've, we've come up with this idea, you know, it, it can be difficult, it can be unintuitive, it can seem perhaps unnecessary, but it's valuable. And it's, it's mm-hmm. a, essential. I would say you could say almost all those other things about the study of logic, at least from the ancient Greek view about it seems unintuitive, seems difficult, seems today unnecessary, but is essential. At least I think the Stoics would argue. So moving now to away from, away from the, you know, the physics, the divinity, the conception of nature, moving to the epistemology and the logic, what do you think I guess, what's your view on that, a core part of the one of the three domains of areas of Stoicism? And do you feel also like that's being not emphasized sufficiently in some modern Stoic communities? And if so, what what is being lost by not focusing on that? Yeah. Before we move on, I just want to make, I want to make one thing perfectly clear because they, my previous up to this point could leave someone with the impression that I think modern Stoicism is a bad thing. I don't. I say that explicitly on my podcast. I've repeatedly encouraged the development of a secular version of Stoicism. It's a different thing. And all I all I am trying to do is get people to, to see that it is a different thing and it's still viable. It's, it's just that it's overlooked by modern Stoics and treated as something that is like some kind of ancient weird religion when it's not. But I'm not opposed to modern Stoicism. I tell my traditional Stoic friends, I say, listen, the, the, this we benefit from modern stoicism in the sense that nobody would be tuning in and listening to what we have to say. They go to the modern stoics first, and then they read the text and they go, "There's something, there's something missing here." Ryan Holiday is not exactly. I'm not getting the same thing when I read his book and I read Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. What's missing? And I get letters on a regular basis from, through my podcast that you know, thank you. Now I know what I'm I'm missing, but. There is a place for mine. I mean, let's face it. If if we could force everybody in the world to read, I won't go as far as to say the obstacles away, but the guide to the good life by Irving, the world would be a better place. If people if people lived the way that Irvine proposed, regardless of the flaws of that book, when we compare it to the ancients, the world would be a better place, a much better place. And if the world just adopts some kind of virtue ethics, it's a better place. So it's not that modern stoicism is bad and wrong and it's just that it, it is a dramatic departure from what Stoicism is, and I just argue that that needs to be openly acknowledged. Now, regard to logic, you know, frankly, I, I don't know how there's, there's some benefit in being able to, one of the things that's not taught in college anymore is logic. For the most part, you have to kind of be in a specialized field to even learn how to apply. You know, we don't need to sit around and study syllogisms all day in order to have a basic understanding of arguments, but we should be able to weigh evidence and say, well, you know, this argument is a fallacy because it maybe it falls into one of these categories of fallacies. And we don't need to be an expert on that. But, you know, intuitively, we kind of get that, that arguments don't make sense in some cases. That is something that people can benefit from. I don't see modern Stoics as walking away from that. They don't, maybe, maybe they don't emphasize, but I've never heard a, an argument from a modern Stoic that says, you know, being logical is just untenable in modern times. Um, I've never heard that. No, maybe it's out there, but I think they do teach logic. They do emphasize logic where I think in part, partly because it can be difficult to understand is when we get to a subcategory of logic, which is epistemology and the idea of how we, how we 
acquire knowledge. You know, the, the Stoics argued that we are born tabula rasa. We ha- are basically a blank slate. Now, they argued that you have, and this would be an argument for an anthropocentric proposivism or providential cosmos, that we do have some innate, what we call predispositions for moral behavior, which Paul, uh, not Paul Bloom, Paul, uh, from, I think he wrote a book called Just Babies not that long ago, investigating this, that children from, at very young ages have this in, innate moral sense that they've been treated fairly or unfairly, that you, know, you give one one cookie and another one two cookies, and somehow innately they know, hey, that's not fair, all of these things. But then on top of that, how do we acquire knowledge? And that's where we get into this you know, misunderstanding of things like control in Stoicism, this misconception when people read in Irvine, you know, the dichotomy of control, and then ultimately the, you know, the, the false idea of a trichotomy. But when they read the dichotomy of control, when they pick up in Chiridian one and they see Epictetus claiming that there's this, you know, there's these two divisions. These are things that this group of things that are, you know, up to us in our power, in our control, depending on which translation you want to read. And we have the same argument in uh, Discourses one. But you, if you search through the entire book, the word control comes up. 80 times in the discourses. And it's not always the Greek that's, you, you know, usually people want to talk about ephemine, ephemine. That's not the only Greek word that the translators translate into control. And the, when the word control comes up in, in discourses, it's quite often being applied by Epictetus, not the word ephemine, but other Greek words that are being translated control to that idea that there's a group of things that are up to us in our power and the group of things that are not up to us and not in our power. So, you know, the beauty of Stoicism is its deeply integrated nature. So when we look, we say, as an example, you know, oikiosis, which is the founding principle of ethics. Well, where does the concept of oikiosis come from, this self-preservation? Well, it comes out of the Stoic physics. It comes out of their idea, their understanding of nature and, and our innate moral character. You know, we get the same thing when we get to epistemology and logic. We're saying that because we have this thing in us that the Stoics call our our rational faculty, our uh, was it dunamis logicae? I think in Greek, you can you can help me out here, Michael. I think that's what. But basically, it's you know, it's that portion of us that is that that is able that is well. Long would call it our self representation. We might call it our self. It's kind of akin to the prohoresis, our will. But there's some subtle distinctions here that we don't need to get into. But in it, I have this rational part of me that is enabled and empowered because it is is rational. And it's a, it's a portion given to me by the divine to look at propositions which are presented to my rational faculty, ironically by my rational faculty. Where do those propositions come from? Those propositions come from the event that occurs out there in the world. So I get this impression, the impression that someone has just insulted me. Well, you know, we oftentimes in modern times, and we would want to say, well, that insult, you just called me a moron that hurt me. Well, the Stoics would say, no, that didn't hurt you. That's, those are just words. So you created a representation in your rational faculty based upon the person that you are, based upon your beliefs about hurtful words, based upon your past experience with people calling you a moron. You created this idea in your rational faculty that says, someone just insulted me and that's wrong. And you might go on to, you know, I need to do something about it. Well, that's the proposition that gets presented to the by it's created by the rational faculty, presented to the rational faculty, to which we get to, we got this magic word called assent. Really, you know, the easiest way I think for people to to apply the word consent is is it's it's a judgment, it's an agreement. So mm-hmm. I can look at this and say, someone just assaulted me. Is that true or false? I'm either going to agree with it or I'm not going to agree with it. If I assent to it, if I agree that someone has just insulted me, then the Stoics would say, well, that's an a, an impulsive impression because my agreement to it is necessarily going to entail an impulse to act, a horme. I'm going to do something. I'm either, they've just insulted me, I'm going to run and cry. They've just insulted me, I'm going to insult them back. They just insulted me, I'm going to punch them in the face. We could come, we could have a whole different, different, you know, different avenues that a person could take. But the first part is I, I've, I've assented to the idea that someone has just insulted me. But that's my creation. And it's what even Lisa Barrett Conan in her recent work, which I think is brilliant on emotions, she's trying to point out that these emotions are not things that happen to us. These emotions are things that we create internally. 
So when I say your word hurt me, there's no word that came from outside that harmed me. I created from within myself this idea that I've been harmed by this word. But that came entirely from within, not from, from the outside. So this epistemology now is tightly integrated with moral psychology. So it, when, when Epictetus is arguing what is up to us, what is not up to us, really what he's saying is the only thing that's up to you is whether you're going to assent to those proposi that proposition or not. Now, out of that, because he also uses language like what's also in your control is your desires and aversions and your impulses. But those really all are byproducts of our assent. Well, the reason mm -hmm. why you believe that you are hurt by the word is because you've assented previously to the idea that words are hurtful. And so all of this comes down to one thing. I get to look at these propositions and I get to assent to them or not assent to them. And that changes everything because therein lies my freedom, which from a logical perspective, from epistemology, brings it all now together, not just my, my ethics, but the physics, because the Stoics argue that in some way the world is all determined, right? That there's this form of determinism and that we are somehow morally responsible within this world of determinism. Well, that can be misconstrued one of two ways. You know, there are some people, when you read some Stoic scholars, they kind of leave you with the idea that, okay, we got all the way to hard determinism, but you didn't explain any of the freedom that I have, you know, that Epictetus talks about. Or we go the opposite direction. You know, I'm in complete control and you know, I'm a, a libertarian idea that, and this is what Michael was arguing against in his article that, that, you know, yeah, I know I've been a drunk for 20 years. I've been a drug addict for 20 years, but today I'm going to, I have so much control. I'm just going to decide not to be an alcoholic. I'm going to decide not to be a drunk. I'm going to decide, even though I've been an angry person my entire life, I'm going to decide not to be an angry person. That's not in your control. What is in your control is you got provoked to anger that one ascent right then is in your control. And you can either feed that angry character that you already had developed, or you can make one ascent to start to maybe unravel that. But that's not going to change instantaneously. That might be years of practice, years of work for you to not become the angry person anymore. And a whole lot of ascents. It doesn't just happen, well, today I'm going to decide not to be a drug addict. I worked with drug addicts. I know that's a fallacy. So, I, I don't think that, I don't think that it's, epistemology is something that's really, I think that it is just so misunderstood in modern Stoicism, which is why we get these books, you know, like, hey, are people just saying, yeah, that's outside my control, so I don't care. So you've basically eradicated oikiosis. You've eradicated the concept of cosmopolitanism because it's not in my control. I don't care about it. And that's the kind of Stoicism that, you know, Becker talked about that, yeah, who wants that? That's, you're, you're, you're kind of a, you're, psych you're psychotic, you know, when you say, yeah, if it doesn't, if it's not personal to me, I don't care about it. That's not what the Stoics were talking about. They're talking about the control in the sense that it's the, the development of your rational faculty, your ability to act appropriately. It's, it's the literally the shaping of what Chrysip has called, you know, the cylinder or the top. So each ascent that we make, each time we ascent to a proposition, we are adding to the bumpiness of that cylinder or sanding it a little bit down, whatever the case might be, depending on how you ascent to that. And over time, lots of ascents, lots of opportunities to change. I can change the way that cylinder rolls the next time it gets pushed by the impulsive impression that I've just been insulted. And at some point, I can completely change the rational faculty to the, to the extent that I can say, well, I'm sorry you have that opinion. Have a good day because you realize it's not an insult. It's not harming you at all. And you just walk away and you'll leave the bully kind of standing there in the hallway thinking, what was that about? Why didn't I get what I was looking for? Which is a, a response from this person by calling them a moron. Yeah, that's right. That's excellent. Very helpful. Yeah, I do think many Stoics come with a respect for epistemology and for logic, but especially new Stoics have uh, trouble figuring out some of what these concepts really mean, especially applying them to specific places in their life. And one can be too quick to say, oh, this is outside of my control, therefore it's okay. Or, you know, I can snap my fingers and make some voluntary change just like this. Whereas I think what you're reminding us is that what the Stoics are ultimately concerned about are assent, agreement to these impressions. And one needs to be, you know, very specific about what one is saying when one says, you know, one has control over a specific situation or one 
thinking about areas in, in your own life. You know, there's always a different, different angles on how to think about whether you should try to change someone else's behavior, but that's a different matter to thinking about what you're assenting to really. So, yeah. And I think part of what, if I see one missing piece in the, the popular dialogue is that this idea that and in, in it, and I think to some degree, the fault lies in some of the scholarship because the words, the word fantasia or impression kind of stretches all the way from, is used to stretch all the way from the, you know, the raw sensory impression of the words or the event that I'm all the way up to and including the development of the representation of that, at which point I can either assent or not to assent to it. And I think what sometimes gets overlooked is the fact that this representation of this event also comes from me. It doesn't come from the outside world. So we need to stop and say, why is it that I even think that I'm harmed by these words? Because that came from me. It didn't come from exterior to me. That's all from me. Why do I think that losing my job is a bad thing? That comes from me, from inside me. It comes from my own rational faculty. It's not an external event that happened to me. The loss of my job is, but the judgment that it's, that's a bad thing was created by me and then presented to me to assent to, yep, it's a bad thing. I should feel bad about that. And that's the piece that I think in Stoic epistemology that is just oftentimes overlooked. And again, it's part of, it's part of our modern culture. People want to be victims of things outside themselves because then they can excuse their own behavior if, if, if it was inspired by something outside themselves. I can tell you coming from the criminal justice system, you know, that is the tactic of defense attorneys. Blame it on anything and everything but the person that's the defendant. Right. Yeah, I think you mentioned Lisa Feldman Barrett earlier, and I think her work's very useful in thinking about, like, you, of course, you have some, so we might call it sensation, initial impression, but that is dealt with concepts. And what are concepts? Well, concepts are things that are informed by your past experience, yes. your past judgments, and you know those might, if you want to, one way to put it, so you don't need to put it this way, but together those concepts and coming sensations would form some sort of proposition that then you would assent to. But already you are creating, you're playing a role in what you are, what you are deciding on. And yes. that role is determined by all these past decisions that you've made, all these past experiences that you've had. Yeah. And she has a, yeah. a very nice, very nice line that I like, which is that often it feels like emotions are this river just running, running through you, but really you are the river and source. You are the source of the river, you know, and, and at the end of A.A. A. Long in his book, Stoic Studies, at the end of his chapter on self, self-representation has a just I mean, mind-boggling passage where he's talking about lecta, the descriptions of things, words that we use. And I'd never made the connection before, but his point is, is that, you know, at that point when we're going to, we, we're being faced with this proposition that I've been harmed, there's another piece that we overlook and we see it in the practice of Marcus Aurelius, but I don't think we associate it in, with the assenting process is we have the opportunity to reframe or redescribe the event that just occurred. So what do you see in Marcus? You know, Marcus could say, wow, look at that beautiful purple royal robe and Im Im imply all of the, the goodness that, that would be you know, come with that, right? Or he can say, it's just a piece of cloth dyed with snail's blood. You know, look at this beautiful meal that's been laid out in front of me, so well prepared. And it's just some dead animals. It's dead creatures. So in other words, he's reframing the impression so that he can look at it from a different way. And that's where we have the opportunity to do that before we assent, because that is the power. That's the only freedom we have. It's what Epictetus talks about. You know, I call it in my podcast, stop it, strip it bare, and view it from a higher perspective. But when we are faced with that, that proposition, whether we're in assent or not, you know, we, can, we can act like a, an irrational human or an animal and just assent to it and have an impulse, or we can say, no, stop. As Epictetus says, stop, let me examine you. Let me consider you. Let me go through a discursive process of really evaluating whether this proposition that you have put in front of me is true or not, and I should assent to it or not. That's our freedom. And it doesn't, it doesn't destroy the causal network the causal, the, the deterministic causal network, because if I say stop here at time one, 
and I analyze, and I analyze enough to become a slightly different person and have a slightly rounder cylinder, then at time two, I can make a different decision. Because over here, the, the Stoics argue you can't choose otherwise. You've just been presented with a proposition, and based upon who you are, your character at that point in time, you are going to assent to that or not. That, there, is no, there is no you could have done otherwise. But what we can do is say, stop, maybe modify myself a little bit so that now I'm not doing otherwise here either. I'm just doing otherwise than what I was here. I can do something different over here than I did over here. Why? Because here I'm a slightly different person. Might be just a little bit, you know, again, I'm not going to, oh, I was a drug addict over here and five minutes later, I'm not a drug addict. I was an angry person here and five minutes later, I'm not. No, that's not going to happen. But you might make the decision that day as an angry person not to punch the guy in the face. And that one decision can make a big difference. It doesn't mean that you're not going to punch him in the face the next time, but now you have a new data point in the cylinder. Hey, I didn't punch the guy in the face and things kind of seem to work out. Or I've got my hand on the door of the liquor store. And for whatever reason today, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to get back in my car and drive away from here. Now tonight I might be back at the liquor store. But this today, and this is what Epictetus is talking about, you know, after, if you've developed this, if, if you go 30 days without buying a bottle of booze, go and make a sacrifice to the gods because now you've developed a new habit. If you've gone 30 days without insulting someone or punching them in the face, well, make a sacrifice to the gods because that's a good thing. You've reformed your, your, your will, your rational faculty a little bit. Excellent. Well, Michael, is there anything else you want us to add? We're coming up towards that uh, time. Yeah, recognize we're out of time. There's, there's two things I wanted to jump in on because this has been a fascinating discussion. Chris, I think that that idea that the impression that I'm going back a bit, but that the impression that we receive, you know, it's already kind of gone through our filter. We've already produced it in a sense is something that, yeah, okay. something that I think, I think I understand where I certainly do understand, but I don't think I, I emphasize enough or, or think about enough in kind of that, in that process. And so for those, for those listening, if it seems unintuitive, the one example I like to think about is the Stoics will talk about this, especially in, in the kind of techne or craft or mastery, even with non-impulsive impressions. So, you know, if you have a mechanic looks at an engine, what they see is very different than what I see when I look at an engine, because the, that that visual information is going through a very different, is being represented to themselves with through their knowledge of cars. And they go, wow, this is a real problem. And for me, I, I think, well, this is a bunch of metal. I don't like, I don't, or something with that, the beautiful painting. And I'm, you know, I'm, I don't have any art history background. I go, oh, that looks kind of, that looks like nothing to me, right? So it happens in those cases too. But then that's also happening in the person insulting you, right? Like it's not the, 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 the sage says, well, that's a person just, you know, just saying words to me who's kind of confused, or maybe as Epictetus says, they're correct. And if they knew all my failures, they would say even they would say yeah. have more to say. And yep. then the second part, I really love the way you put it, Chris. This the way you talk about the space between impression and assent as you know, person one and person two, because you can think, well, if, if the world's deterministic, what's this point of putting it into practice? What's this point? I'm going to assent the way I, I assent. But when you add that tie, you can, as you said, you can reframe or you can, you know, introduce teachings. You can think about it. And as I said, that, that person, five seconds, one second, five minutes later can be a different person in that space, especially if you've cultivated this habit of contemplating stoicism and testing the impressions against these stoic principles. So I, I wanted to flesh out those two things. Nothing else to add, but but and I guess the third thing I wanted to say was that that's great examples of of the link then between epistemology, as it, you know, physics, epistemology, and ethics. Because it sounds like we're talking about ethics, about how do you respond to the situation. But if you if you lose the epistemology and the physics in there, the, the conception of what's going on, you don't you, you don't have no way of kind of making sense of, of the the ethical implications in those situations. So wanted to add that, but I think I think a great way of putting it. No other, no, yeah. no other. Oh, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, and and that was the argument of the ancient Stoics. Yeah, you know, that that all three pieces had to be there together in order for you to understand the whole. Which is why they're similes. And when we think about them, it's a what is it? It's an egg, and it's an animal, and an orchard. They didn't compare Stoicism to a house with a floor and walls and a roof. They didn't compare it to a cart with wheels and, a, and a, a body and a tongue to pull it by. They used three organisms. And the difference is, you know, we can take the wheels off of a 
can take the roof off of a house and still have kind of a structure. You can take the floor out and still have a dirt floor. But when you take any part of an organism out, the, the rest of it goes away. And that deeply integrated nature, which is why is where A.A. A. Long is coming from when he says, if you remove these pieces, you end up with a system that he calls broken back. It's, it doesn't mean, and again, this doesn't it mean that it's useless. It just means it's not the same thing as what the Stoics integrated. And you're going to have to come up with a different way of filling in these pieces because without it, it's, it's broken. I think, you know, if listeners listen to the past episodes, they'll know that, you know, I'm more agnostic on these questions about the Stoic God. And I think, like, if you can be happy on a torture rack, you could be happy in a godless universe as well. But the idea that you should take it, this thought seriously, I don't think the argument that the Stoic God is untenable in light of modern science is a persuasive one. So I think just listeners should, you know, think through these issues themselves. And we've noted plenty of great resources for them to do that if you want to go into anything else. And then I'll leave you with the last word, Chris. Yeah, again, I, I think we're in agreement. I'm not opposed to modern Stoicism. I think, in fact, I've encouraged it. I think modern Stoics need to continue to try to develop a, a version of Stoicism that is appropriate for our secular age. And I'm just asking, don't, don't destroy the old path because the old path is there for a reason. There's lots of people that listen to my podcast who hear this and they say, this is what I'm looking for. I don't like religion. Maybe I was an atheist, whatever, but there's something missing and, and this is it. And the Stoics offer it. It's a viable path in modern times. Both paths can coexist. I was an agnostic. I was an atheist. So I understand the difficulty of coming to Stoicism. I read Marcus in the 1990s and put it back on my bookshelf because I couldn't deal with all the God talk in it. It was, those were trigger words for me. And that's why I think this other, this other path needs to be created. The difference is it's a distinct path. And in your intellectual heritage, Michael, you know, Brad Inwood has called that in his language, not mine. He calls that minimal Stoicism. He, he says that basically modern Stoicism can trace its heritage, its lineage back to Aristo of Chios. And he calls that minimal Stoicism. And he calls the other path large Stoicism. Now, maybe that language entails one's better than the other and shouldn't, but certainly the language of modern Stoicism entails that it's better, right? So somehow we need to come to this place where we can coexist. And that's why I love discussions like this with you know people like you, because this furthers moderns and traditionals to understand one another. We're not each other's enemies. The world's a better place if they're modern Stoics, the world's a better place if they're, and they're better people, if they're modern Stoics or traditional Stoics. It's not a battle. It's just, but for me, my struggle is to keep the traditional inter interpretation of Stoicism alive against what I see as an onslaught of modern Stoicism that just wants to squelch it, make it go away, make it as if it's something that doesn't matter anymore. It's irrelevant. It's untenable. All of those words. And I say, no, it, it's not. It still is tenable in modern times. Not for everybody, but I don't make that argument. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks. Chris. Thank you for having me. Uh -huh.